Hello and welcome to Attacking Third. We're live on YouTube with you all today to chat all about team by team previews. We are going to continue talking about North Carolina Courage and Orlando Pride. We're going to hit you with the previews. So make sure that you drop your thoughts into the chat. We want to know what you think all about North Carolina and Orlando leading up to the regular season. Hello and welcome to Attacking Third CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. Joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host Lisa Roman, broadcaster and analyst for CBS Sports. On today's segment, we are going to start with a North Carolina Courage preview. So before we take a deep dive into all that, leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. We're also on YouTube, so please subscribe to us at youtube.com slash attacking third to get all sorts of exclusive NWSL content, previews, recaps, and interviews right here on Attacking Third. The NWSL season starts March 25th, and you can watch all games on Paramount+. Plus. We're doing every single team preview on A3. That's right, all 12 teams. You can catch them on podcasts or on YouTube. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell your neighbors. Tell your pets. Tell, tell everybody because <laughs> the regular season will be here before we know it. Lisa, we're, we're rolling on. We're, we're talking about more teams. We're talking about the courage today. We we're cruising. We're cruising with our previews. Um, it's fun. It's really getting me excited for the season because we get to, we do a lot of prep work that goes into these episodes to kind of deep dive everything. And of course we've been following these teams for years and, and we followed the draft, we covered it live. So like a lot of this info is already in our brain, but the more I kind of read articles about these teams and, about this season to come about their preseason games that they've already have had and they've played in. It gets me more and more excited. Um, so I just hope that we can kind of convey a little bit of that excitement to everyone else, because the season is literally around the corner. It is, it is almost here. I cannot wait for it. March 25th, Paramount plus watch all the NWSL games that you could ever hope and dream for. I love that. That you can never hope and dream for. Uh, and, you know, we're going to get uh, a, a thrilling opening weekend. All 12 clubs are going to compete uh, over the course of opening weekend. Uh, and that includes North Carolina Courage. So let's let's talk a little bit about the Courage to date as they are uh, building up to their uh, home opener in the, in the regular season. Uh, led by head coach uh, Sean Nehas. This is going to be his second full season with the team. Uh, they went ahead and fleshed out some of the technical staff as well. Uh, welcomed Fabrice Gatra as an assistant coach uh, with the staff. They are trying to build off of their finish in 2022. North Carolina Courage finishing in number seven. They uh, were seventh in the standings. And probably the, the team with the buzz around them as actual playoff bubble contenders. There were a lot of teams in the playoff conversation, yeah. but it's one thing to be a team who's actually in contention for a playoff spot. And that actually belonged to the courage. Unfortunately, it came down to that final weekend as it typically does in this league now. Uh, and they just narrowly missed out on a playoff spot uh, with a nine, five and eight record at number seven, but no playoffs for the first time in their uh, franchise history. Um, so we were curious how this club was going to navigate their off season. Uh, because what do you do when you're that, when you're so used to having um, the type of history that you have where you're constantly going to the playoffs and yet you just narrowly miss out. What do you do to try to ensure that you get back to that point? Um, and they participate. They tried to participate in free agency a little bit. They definitely wanted to try to retain uh, Dabinia, but they were unable uh, to do that. They had a pretty active draft day themselves. And uh, they've added some other players through just signings and, and acquisitions. And um, we took a look at all of their moves over the offseason, and we ended up giving them an offseason grade of a C. Uh, we just thought that they added some pieces, but maybe didn't do – enough to, to sort of really kind of boost those uh, chances of, of making their return to the playoffs. But uh, we'll, we'll see, of course, and we'll talk a little bit more about why. Uh, but some of the pieces that they added to this team are very interesting and in how we might see them utilized uh, with the courage and on those game day starting 11s. Uh, they added in free agency defender Estelle Johnson. Um, they also engaged in that uh, – 
that multiplayer trade on on uh, racing Louisville side uh, with Emily Fox arriving to uh, to the courage for both Abby Ursic and Carson Pickett, uh, Tyler Lucy now uh, with the courage. Uh, they also announced the signing of a Danish forward and uh, Amelia Gail Jensen, uh, and they also had a pretty active draft. This is the second consecutive year that we noted that that North Carolina Courage had multiple first round picks and they ended up going with Sydney Collins, Clara Robbins, Haley Hopkins, and Olivia Wingate to sort of recap some of the acquisitions and the, uh, and the draftees. Yeah. I think with Sean Nahas um, looking at this team and kind of what's been given in front of him and reflecting on 2022, it was a pretty hot and cold season in my mind because North Carolina goes on to win the Challenge Cup um, at the start of the year. It was the first time we really get to see the magic of Dabinia and Caroline together on the pitch. And then they really kind of just fell off throughout the regular season. Towards the end of it, they really picked it back up, and they were a bubble team that was pushing and doing everything they could. I, I think a lot of pressure fell on the shoulders of players like Caroline Dabinia, Diana Ordonez to step up and, and carry this team, Denise O'Sullivan, towards the end of that regular season last year. And because of that, I, I think the coaching staff at North Carolina realized we have to spread the wealth a little bit. We have to make sure that – we have consistency and balance across this entire roster. And I think for them to pick up a defender in Estelle Johnson is massive. This is a veteran in the league who has been consistent over the last several years, getting minutes uh, most recently with Gotham and playing a lot of time at a team that also faced a lot of backlash in 2022. I think for Johnson, this is a, a really good move personally for her to go to a North Carolina team that is a contender that has a history of winning and has a history of success that they're trying to get back to. Um, and then Emily Fox across that back line as well. I mean, and North Carolina also has Casey Murphy in goal, right? This is a United States women's national team caliber goalkeeper. And now you're adding a veteran in Estelle Johnson and the U.S. women's national team defender in Emily Fox to that back line. Plus they're adding in a little bit of international flair um, out of Denmark and, and Japan uh, with Millie Jean Jensen, um, Millie Gael Jensen, excuse me. And then Narumi Miura. Uh, this is, these are big ads, right? These are big pieces for this team. Plus Forward Tyler Lucy, formerly a defender, perhaps. I mean, always a forward, but with Angel City and under Freya Coom, uh, Lucy really playing uh, in the back line. I'm not sure where we'll see her right now for Sean Neha. She's listed as a forward on their roster, but I could see her playing across the back line considering the other defenders and the other pieces that they have. Um, and, and I agree. I think that the draft class for North Carolina – not too bad, right? They, they picked up some pieces that they need. No names that really were like top five that you were looking at. I, I know when we recapped the draft, Sandra, we were a little disappointed that North Carolina didn't go for some of those bigger names, um, those impact players that can make an, a, an impact right away with this North Carolina side. But they did get some depth players and, and trying to build out that roster. But they also lost a lot in the off season. Yeah. They lost a lot. It's a balance game between what you're adding, what you're gaining and what you're signing and what you're losing. And I think North Carolina lost more than they gained. I think on paper when you're sort of, you know, comparing the law the the losses and departures uh to the column that has, you know, the acquisitions and the additions to the team. Yeah, I think early perspective is maybe they're the, the team is on the losing side of that. But I think there's also something to be said that maybe there's some unknowns and some unknown variables, right? Cause we don't know how, um, like you mentioned, like we don't know how Tyler Lucy is going to be utilized with, with this team. Um, I have a feeling maybe it's going to be on the back line just yeah. because of some of those losses, right? We're talking not just one, but two of your starting outside backs uh, with Matthias and with Pickett at this point, having, uh, you know, departed from the team. Uh, so maybe we're going to see, you know, Lucy w within there, but I mean, it's hard to replace a big 
big piece of that midfield in somebody like Dibinia. So, you know, are we going to see uh, Narumi Miura go ahead and slot in and try to uh, present something a little bit different for this North Carolina Courage team? Um, this was a, a signing for me that was I was kind of excited about. Um for folks who aren't aware, you know, has played with the, you know, Japan's international team for, for some time. Um, maybe you got to see a little bit during two beliefs. Maybe you even got to see a little bit during um, the, the women's cup uh, on Paramount plus mm -hmm. when uh, Tokyo Verde Bayes, I was participating in the tournament in Louisville. Um, so I'm a little curious as to how they want to slot a player like this into, into the mix um, as well. But uh, Emily Fox, obviously a big one there, like how, Maybe you went out in, in these trades, in these trade acquisitions, you went out and you replaced what you essentially lost uh, in, in a Matthias and or a Pickett. Right. But we're not, again, these are the unknowns. We're actually not going to know until we see it uh, all come together uh, on the pitch for for this team. So I, I think there's a number of clubs that we could look at and sort of say, gosh, they lost a lot in the offseason. And I think there's a handful of them. And I think you at this point, we include the courage within that in terms of some of the teams that yeah. had a lot of losses. I, I I think the courage did lose a lot. I mean, they lost three of their defenders, three of their four defenders across the back line. In Amarit Mathias as an outside back, Carson Pickett as an outside back, yeah. and Abby Ursag as your center back. Yeah. Five, starters, five starters, essentially. Yes. And then you lose Dabinia in the midfield, which no, uh, she was a big part of that midfield playing alongside Denise O'Sullivan and, and Ryan Williams, whoever else happened to be playing in there. But Dabinia was a big, big part of that. And then you lose your rookie of the year contender in Diana Ordonez as, as a forward. These are all big, big losses. Yeah. Five starters for this team. Um, five players that were really influential in the year last year and, and what they did. I think there, there are some silver linings in that they re-signed someone like a Denise O'Sullivan. They re-signed someone like a Casey Murphy. Those are definitely some positives coming out of North Carolina, but uh, these losses are, are really big, really, really big. Um, and only one of them to free agency, but perhaps the, the I mean, not perhaps to be the biggest free agent candidate that there was. And it was announced pretty early that she would not be returning to North Carolina. Um, and that was when the speculation started. But I just, yeah, I think this is one of the teams in the NWSL that had a, a rough offseason with what they lost. No, I'm with you. But we got to take a look at, at the roster overhaul, maybe to sort of highlight the bigger picture of what could come uh, in the near future for this team as the regular season approaches on March 25th. So we're going to break down uh, the roster by position for everyone right after a quick break. So stick with us. Okay, let's keep uh, let's keep breaking down this roster for North Carolina Courage because we're still operating in preseason uh, mode a little bit until that official whistle kicks off the things on March 25th. Um, so let's take a look at how they sort of presented uh, a preseason roster here. They had three goalkeepers listed with uh, Marissa Bova, Casey Murphy, Caitlin Rowland. They had 10 defenders, uh, Malaya Berkeley, Sydney Collins, uh, the draftee, Estelle Johnson, in their free agent signing Emily Fox, Kaylee Kurtz, Kiki, uh, Kiki Pickett, Ryan Williams. Um, that's 10 for defenders. And we've got eight midfielders, Emily Gray, Denise O'Sullivan, Brianna Pinto, Clara Robbins, Meredith Speck, Frankie Taglafieri. Then we've got nine forwards, okay? Tess Bode, Millie Farrow, uh, Millie Gild Jensen, Haley Hopkins, Tyler Lucy listed as a forward, uh, Rick Madison, Caroline, Brittany Radcliffe, and Olivia Wingate. Uh, Jennifer Cujo was initially um, a non-roster invitee, but we haven't seen her uh, named in any official capacity to – uh, any of the preseason uh, roster. So, you know, curious about that, if, if, if there's a, a path for this player to, to link up with the courage. But in terms of what we're, you know, seeing in front of us, um, outside of maybe some of the players that we've chatted about already, those acquisitions, we talked about Tyler Lucy and how they maybe want to utilize her, thinking, hey, maybe they're going to utilize her in the outside back position, but they've got her listed as a forward, um, you know, in, in this preseason roster. And that's not to say that mm -hmm. she – 
might not <laughs> go to a converted um, outside back position because that's ultimately what we saw with Angel City. Was She was also listed as a forward with that team. Saw time on the uh, top line with Angel City. But as injuries and things sort of came into play, we saw Angel City and Freya Coombe kind of shake some things around, and we saw Tyler Lucy get some shifts in at outside back. So I'm a little curious if this will stay the way it is. Um, but nine forwards, that's that's a, that's a hefty number, I think, compared to some of the other rosters that we've seen, that we've seen anywhere from, you know, five, six, or seven. Yeah, I agree. I think it is a lot to have nine forwards. Um, and for Tyler Lucy, I, I think we'll see her across the back line. It doesn't really matter what her position says on the roster. Coach can play her anywhere he wants. Um, I mean, we talked about that with Freya Coombe and Angel City. Who knows where these players could play? Uh, but when you look at this North Carolina roster and, and kind of how everything is broken down, one name that I am – interested to watch this year is Emily Gray. This is a midfielder for North Carolina Courage that is in her second second year with the Courage. Um, she was drafted in 2022, and she didn't do wow. that much last year. She didn't. It, it, I was a little disappointed, and maybe it was the situation she was put in. Maybe it was um, the the season. Maybe it was the team, the style of play, the formation. But this was a number three draft pick out of the 2022 draft going to North Carolina. Um, massive for this type of player out of Virginia Tech. Um, maybe a little bit unassuming, but a top-notch player. And now that they have shifted some things around in the midfield, I mean – Honestly, having Dabinia leave this roster changes things. How are we going to see North Carolina roll out in their formation? Because you're no longer building a formation and a team around one individual player, Dabinia. That's that's what was happening before. And it worked really well for North Carolina. Now they have a little bit more freedom, I think, to – utilize players in in the best way for them i'm looking at someone like a denise o'sullivan defensively she's got to be their go-to in the midfield she's wearing the captain's armband for this team this year this is a player in denise o'sullivan that has got to step up and i think emily gray can learn from a player like denise o'sullivan and understand that the freedom and the flexibility in the midfield with this team and and depending on how they're going to play I think someone like an Emily Gray could be utilized a lot this year. But when you look at these this front line and these forwards that are listed, I don't know who's going to start uh, because there are nine listed yeah. and a, a lot of question marks there. I mean, Caroline is a shoo-in for uh, this team and, and kind of her position on it. But otherwise, there's a lot of question marks around this this front run, front line nine players. No, I'm with you. And I think it's important to sort of know um, the the midfield in that, you know, and how they will connect to who potentially is going to be that mm -hmm. top line there. Um, I think I think Emily Gray is a good child to sort of note that you want to maybe see a player take that next step. Um, yeah, this is this is a look. This is a franchise that has had now two consecutive first rounds with multiple picks and. I don't think it's an unfair question to ask, like, what's going to be the next step in the development for some of these players? When you've got um, when you've got that many first round picks, the general concept around that is, oh, like you're going to get some pretty good talent if you've got mm -hmm. not just one, but multiple first rounders. Yeah. And the the general mindset being like, oh, maybe some of them might fall to the second rounds and maybe you can get, you know. Uh, a somewhat ready player out of there if you if you go ahead and continue the development so maybe coming out of last year when you still had you know someone like like Dabinia when you still you know when you still have someone um you know like a Denise O'Sullivan or even a Meredith Speck at this point you know who's been with the team for some time you know do do those first year players um get an opportunity to get you know, extended, extended minutes. Maybe we saw that go to some players like a, like a Diana Ordonez or Caroline, an international signing that they made, um, you know, for attacking purposes. Right. So I'm, I'm curious as to what that next step is going to be, not just for their current draft class, but what's that next step going to be for the draft class that they had just last year? Um, where's the development? We want to see it. Right. But I'm also looking at somebody like a Brianna Pinto, right? This is someone who's technically going to enter, um, third year, I believe, with yep. in, in the NWSL. Um, and I'm 
I'm eager to sort of see her kind of rise and become a face uh, of this franchise, right? Spend a lot of time uh, in North Carolina with uh, with UNC. And um, I think it's someone that they can try to continue to, to build around and build with. Um, and what that's going to look like in 2023, I think we'll find out right away. So, um Cur again, a lot of a lot of question marks. I think then there are uh, answers for for North Carolina Courage right now in terms of the roster in front of them. Um, but it, it it leads us to wonder, like, who in twenty twenty three for the Courage is going to be that young prospect to look out for? Who do we want to see maybe have a breakout year, and who is going to be that experienced veteran, perhaps that they lean on? You know, we're talking a little bit about the back to back draft classes that this team had, and just coming out of this most recent one, you and I. Hung on Philly, got to see uh, this up close. Uh, we're going to go with Olivia Wingate here out of North, uh, excuse me, Notre Dame, uh, because we talked a little bit about how they made those selections in the first round. And you said, hey, maybe there was some talent there that you thought that they should have went with, but yeah. they ended up making a different selection. And I think Olivia Wingate might have been one of these players um, that perhaps, you know, raised a couple of eyebrows and peaked a couple of ears up uh, when we, when the name was called for North Carolina courage, but a uh, strong program in, in Notre Dame scored a, lot, scored a lot of goals and uh, listen, it's a world cup year. We've talked a lot about that, how when there are international cycles that come into play, that there are certain players and opportunity or there are certain opportunities that present themselves to players and maybe they'll get a chance to, to capitalize on those opportunities in front of them. So we're going with uh, Olivia Wingate. I think this is a good shout as a young prospect to keep an eye on because during the draft, there were maybe more uh, eligible, qualified, best available players still on the board. And Sean Nahas went with Wingate, not, not a local product. She's outside of Boston and from Massachusetts, uh, went to Notre Dame. And as you mentioned, had a stellar career, 14 goals, five assists in her final season in 2022 at Notre Dame. So one season alone, um, led her team throughout the NCAA tournament to the elite eight. She was a first team, all ACC selection, a third team, all American selection. Um, this was a, a big time player that maybe didn't have the spotlight as some of the other players that were initially listed in this draft. And I think that's something that maybe drew Sean Nahas to a player like Wingate because of the draft class that they got Sydney Collins, Claire Robbins, Haley Hopkins, Olivia Wingate. None of these names were so top notch, right. Uh, of what these players could do um, in terms of this draft class. But I think Olivia Wingate is one that could really step into this team. I mean, picture her Olivia Wingate uh, as this type of forward alongside someone like a Caroline ahead of someone in the midfield, um, like an Emily Gray, uh, Denise O'Sullivan, or Brianna Pinto. I could see that type of midfield happening. I'm excited about what Wingate can do with this team. And I think, North Carolina Courage is going to have to lean on some of these players that are first year experience or second year experience and, and how they can step up and do that. And Wingate's one that's ready for it coming out of Notre Dame for sure. I'm excited to see what this what this player can do, especially I mean, we're talking about, you know, whether or not some of these younger players are going to have the opportunity to get more time. So I think if, if she does, maybe it's something alongside of uh, or inside of a challenge cup. Maybe we'll get to see some exciting moments from this player. But with so many players sort of either entering a sophomore season or a first year as a professional, you know, of course we anticipate that maybe they'll try to pull from, you know, their experienced veterans around them. And while we're talking a little bit about the off season earlier in this episode and the losses that this team had, there were a lot of veteran pieces that are no longer with this team. Um, so yes, we, we still see someone on this courage roster with De Denise O'Sullivan uh, really the only uh, remaining piece from those former championship years. Um, but who else is, is going to be that player that could sort of step up and sort of be the, you know, provide that, that leadership. Um, and you know what, I think we're still looking along the defensive line in this one, even in the absence of, of someone like an Abby Ersek or Carson Pickett. And uh, we're going to go with Kaylee Kurtz. We feel like this is a player who's uh, already become a little bit, of an important piece for this courage back line. And I think in light of some of those off season uh, uh, departures, uh, Kurtz is in a really strong position to kind of, 
maybe emerge as, as one of those those faces or one of those vocal leaders for for this team in 2023. I agree completely. Kaylee Kurtz ha- is a player that stepped up immensely in 2022. She solidified her position in that back line. She started 22 matches. Every game that she played in, she started. Um, and really, it, she she took shots throughout the year. She contributed in the attack as a center back. That's really difficult to do. But that's the confidence that we're seeing from Kaylee Kurtz and, and this type of team. And when you look at the players that North Carolina lost across their back line, Merritt Mathias, Abby said Carson Pickett, it leaves room for someone like a Kaylee Kurtz to really step in and take over that back line. I imagine we'll see someone like an Estelle Johnson and a Kaylee Kurtz solidify themselves in that center back duo, uh, playing alongside an Emily Fox in an outside back role. That's really exciting to me. But Kaylee Kurtz is the one amongst Johnson and Fox that has the experience playing in North Carolina under Sean Nahas last year and understands what it's like to play behind someone like a Denise O'Shea that – um, she can take to the next level. She can build off of in 2022 where she became a solidified starter on this roster. Now continue that into consistency and leadership, vocal organization on this roster. I, I think it could be a really good year for Kaylee Kurtz. I want to see, uh, I also want to see Kaylee Kurtz score some more goals. I mean, there were a couple of moments there and <laughs> during mm-hmm. the season with, with the courage where uh, it was her actually coming up big on some of those set mm-hmm. pieces. Uh, plays and and not necessarily Abby Ersek, which who was in the maybe in the past kind of like a more f- frequent target for them. So uh, I, I I would love to see it. You would like to see it. Um, and I think this is the year to see it because we're talking about how there's a cycle. There's a World Cup year coming up here uh, in in 2023, and there's a uh, there's a lot of players <laughs> on this team that the courage may say goodbye to for a certain period of time. Now, um, these are just, you know, predictions uh, several months out from the World Cup. There there have not been any um, final rosters named um, yet for, for certain international teams, but we're, we're going off the assumption that, I don't know, somebody like a Caroline is going to go to the World Cup with Brazil. Somebody like Denise O'Sullivan will be on that final roster uh, for Ireland. Uh, but there's some unknowns in, in terms of who else might um, – you know, be unavailable for this team in, in 2023 for long stretches of time. You know, is Naomi Mira going to, you know, be with Japan uh, in the World Cup? Are they going to lose a couple of their Danish players, right? Whether it's in somebody like Jensen or, or Manson. So that's a, that's a, that's a hefty amount of players. I think when you've got more than three that potentially can, can, um, make an exit during the season. Um, that's a big thing. And the list just keeps going because there's also the possibility of Casey Murphy uh, yeah. not being available for this team as well. Um, and the possibility of her uh, being on international duty with the United States. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking anywhere from the possibility of, of three locks to, you know, to six players uh, missing uh, for at least uh, a hefty chunk of time here. Um so maybe, yeah, maybe this is the year that we're going to see uh, some opportunities present themselves to some of the younger players on this team. I agree completely. Six players to lose is a lot of players to lose. And I imagine they'll all be starters or, or giving consi- significant time to North Carolina. Um, I, I think some of the big names, I mean, Casey Murphy, you're losing your starting goalkeeper at this point to go to the World Cup with the United States. Now you do have an incredible veteran in Caitlin Rowland. You've also got Marissa Bova there to kind of slot into that role, but it's really tricky to lose your goalkeeper. Um, it, it's really tough for these teams to do that. And then Caroline and Denise O'Sullivan, I, I the these two are incredible players. They're leaders. They're game changers on the pitch for North Carolina and for their respective countries when they play. I mean, that's going to be a big loss. Those are going to be some holes to fill. How does Sean Nahas fix that? Find those holes. Does Is there a formation change? How do you make sure that you're giving these six potential players that are leaving with their country in the middle of the summer enough time at the start of the season to get your team in a right position? That's the big balance. Can you get your team in the right position, stack up as many points, wins, ties, three and one point games? That way you're sitting at a pretty good position in the table by the time July comes around and now you're saying goodbye to some big starters while 
also throughout the first several months of the season, giving time to some of these younger players because they're going to have to step in. And you want that to be a seamless transition when your internationals leave. That's the biggest question mark. Um, I I think Denise O'Sullivan is one that it's going to be really hard for this team to lose come World Cup time as she makes her departure with Ireland, a, a debutante in the World Cup this year. That's that's a spot I'm really looking at the midfield for North Carolina. We'll see. I, I love hearing you talk about it a little bit in terms of how the absence of some of these World Cup players might affect the team this season, because I think that kind of transitions into our biggest burning question for this team in this season. You know, we chatted a little bit about it earlier in the beginning of this preseason. Yes, they were a team that ended up being contenders, like for real in contention bubble playoff team and they started off their 2022 with a challenge cup win so you've got an exciting start and you've got an exciting finish for this team in 2022 and there was a whole chunk of middle where they were fighting to no longer be in last place during the regular season so we saw two different halves of a season for this North Carolina Courage team in 2022. And we really saw them turn it on towards that second half with these amazing individual performances, whether it was out of Dabinia or uh, uh, Diana Ordonez Mm -hmm. breaking a rookie record with goals scored. So what's that going to mean for this team in 2023? The biggest burning question we have for them is can they put together a consistent season? in the regular season for 2023. We just did not see any consistency. I don't think from North Carolina in 2022, it was, it was a struggle. They had really high highs and then really low lows after they won the challenge cup. I think there was a bit of pressure on this team and the regular season came and kind of smacked them in the face, like the cold on a, a winter day. And they had the breakout players like a Caroline, a Diana Ordonez to, to run things down at the end of the season and push them into playoff contention. But can they be that, that consistency? And I think it does come into play during the international break and how, how they're going to stay on top of it, how they're going to stay consistent. They can't let up. They've got to really continue to grind and, and put together complete 90 minute games over the course of the entirety of the season. And if they can do that, they will be another team that's pushing for a playoff spot at the end of it. I don't think they will be this top powerhouse team of North Carolina that we've seen in the past. There's just too many new pieces that they have to put together, but they could be another playoff contention team. They'll, they'll be on the bubble at the end of this season. All right, so then that's going to lead us into our projected finish for this team in 2023. Uh, we love ranges here. We love guesstimations. We love to give a spectrum for everyone to, to fall on here. So we're looking at North Carolina Courage to close out their 2023. There's a possibility that they can, you know, go on a run like they did in 2022 and actually break through to the playoffs, maybe as a six seed. But things can also go awry, and we have them falling as low as ninth if things go the opposite direction for them. So somewhere between six and nine, six would be an improvement because they ended off in 2022 and seventh, and obviously eight or nine would be um, a little bit of a step a step back for them. So we'll have to see where they lie. Yeah, but even at a six, it's – I mean, you're making the playoffs at that point, but but we don't really have them much higher than that. I, I don't think they'll host. A, they definitely won't be a top one or two team this year, uh, but they could get in there. They could travel, be on the road for the first couple rounds of playoffs. Um, I mean, postseason comes. Who knows what could happen? Anything could happen in the postseason. But, yeah, I, I think it'll be a tough season for North Carolina. Um, it'll be tough for them to kind of pull out and, and get that consistency factor down. I heard that. Well, we still got to do more previews for all 12 teams coming up. Uh, We're going to take a deep dive on Orlando Pride. So stick around and hear our Orlando Pride preview. Meanwhile, on Paramount Mountain. Okay, we have the Northern Face, the Southern Face, and... The Sylvester Stallone Face. Stallone! Of course. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Is that Dad? Uh, Yeah. No, 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 don't sneeze. Dear God, no. Hold it. Hold it. Don't do it. Go. Ha! Gesundheit. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome into Attacking Third. I'm Sandra Rera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. Joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host, Lisa Roman, broadcaster and analyst for CBS Sports. On today's segment, we're doing an Orlando Pride preview. So before we take a deep dive into Orlando Pride, make sure you leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. That helps us out so much here at A3. We're also on YouTube, so please subscribe to us at youtube.com slash attacking third. Make sure you get exclusive NWSL content previews, recaps, and interviews right here on attacking third. The NWSL season begins March 25th. You can watch games on Paramount Plus, and we are doing a team preview for every single team all 12 clubs you can catch them on our podcast or on youtube make sure you tell your friends tell your family tell your neighbors tell your pets tell everybody tell everybody who you can tell about the 2023 nwsl regular season because it's coming up and we have to chat about all of the teams before march 25th gets here and we're going to chat about orlando pride now let's start with a little bit of an overview for Orlando Pride and get everyone caught up with their offseason. They're going to be led in 2023 by Seb Hines, officially promoted to head coach. This is going to be his first full season with the team. Uh, was named interim head coach uh, last season, June 7th, um, and then fully full-time with the team uh, this November. So going to have beginning, middle, and an end with this Orlando Pride side. They also made some other front office notable hires, Haley Carter as VP of Soccer Operations and General Manager, Joe Barnes, uh, who initially was uh, an interim assistant last year, is going to return as a as a full-time first assistant. And additionally, Paul Crichton, going to be the team's goalkeeper coach. So a uh, lot of additions uh, with, with any time you add a new head coach uh, comes – additional hires sort of flesh out technical staff and stuff like that. So cool to see a lot of different parts here for Orlando pride moving forward in 2023. And uh, hopefully it'll help them improve on last year's standing because we left Orlando pride in 2022 in a 10th place standing on the NWSL table with a five, seven and 10 record. So 12 teams, 10th place, Safe to say that's the bottom half of the table. We were curious as to what their offseason was going to look like. How are they going to – who are they going to hire, right? That was one of the question marks. Who are they going to hire as head coach? Were they going to promote Seb Hines? They answered that question pretty fairly quickly in their offseason. Uh, but how are they going to navigate something like the first ever free agency period for the league? Uh, how are they going to um, – you know, uh, handle their draft as as they entered the the 2020, 2023 draft with a couple of, of really promising picks. And how were they going to navigate that event? Um, so they did some interesting things, I think, coming out of the draft specifically. I wouldn't say that they were necessarily winners in the free agency period, but this was a team that definitely made some uh, international signings. They went ahead and they targeted their draft to help sort of flesh out uh, their roster looking ahead to 2023. And we gave their overall offseason a solid B. We liked the pieces. We liked the moves that they made and the pieces that they targeted to add on to this team. We wanted to maybe see a little bit more from this team out of free agency, but hey, it's the first. It was the first year for everyone. You can't can't win them all. So we're giving a, a full B for uh, Orlando Pride in the off season grade. But um, a big part of that was making sure that they re-signed Marta because this was a player that was listed on free agency could have been one of many players who exercised the right to, to, to play in, uh, in, in her options of the free agency period, but opted to resign with Orlando pride. And Marta is going to make her return with the pride this season. We've already got to see her uh, play some minutes in she believes cup uh, against the United States, Canada, and Japan uh, immediately contributing to a goal um, with the Binya in one of the matches. Uh, so it's exciting. I think there's a lot of excitement there to see um, this type of legend make her return, not only to the pitch, but uh, to Orlando Pride, because this is a player that has now been with this team for a number of years now. You can really say that uh, this is this 
city has kind of become her home and where she has sort of chosen to, to sort of close out these final stages uh, of her, her career. Uh, but they also included a, another Brazilian player in, in signing Adriana as well. And they had a very successful draft. Yeah, I think with this Orlando team and the offseason grade of a B, it can be a little bit objective um, because of how this goes. And that's why the fact that we landed on a B is is pretty good for this Orlando side, considering um, the, the 2022 that they had. I think re-signing and getting uh, head coach Seb Hines on board full time was massive when when Hines took over in June of last year, he turned the team around and so much of what he talked about at the end of 2022 was that he wished he had more time with this team. He wished he had more time to mold them, to shape them, to, to have them buy into his coaching philosophy. He started to do two a days with that team in June when he took over and he said that it really helped. That's, that's what he wanted this team to know and understand. We actually had the pleasure of speaking with him about a month ago and he talked about how he was really excited to sink his teeth in from preseason, the start of the year with this team. And I think that the initial signing of free agent Marta was massive for this team. Now, that's all that was on paper. But there was a lot of speculation before this, during the free agency period, where Orlando was trading some players around, getting lots of money. They were kind of gobbling up different money from trades and everything like that, that it was speculated that Orlando was going after a free agent in Dabinia out of North Carolina, Brazilian midfielder, to play alongside someone like Amarta in the midfield to really turn this Orlando team around. Now, that did not happen. Orlando did not get Dabinia. Dabinia ended up going to Kansas City. And I think if you take that into account, that might be a bit of a, a failure for this Orlando side because they put so many eggs in that Dabinia basket. However, they bounced back pretty quickly and, and kind of, I don't want to say shook it off by any means, but they didn't say, they didn't show their full cards to say, we wanted a Dabinia. We did not get her. We're upset because they did sign someone like a, uh, an Adriana midfielder, another Brazilian midfielder to play alongside Marta. And you're right, Sandra. They had a draft class that was very impressive for a first time NWSL coach to go through a draft process. They drafted the best defensive prospect in the NWSL draft this year, Emily Madrill. She was out of Florida State University and had an interesting path into the league. She ended up signing with a contract with the NWSL that allowed her to go on loan to play in Sweden last year. So she could then enter the 2023 draft. So this is a player that has experienced not only winning national championships with Florida State University and anchoring a back line, but also already playing professionally. That's a leg up on anyone else in the draft class. Um, I think Emily Madrill is going to be a massive boost for this Orlando Pride roster. And they also ended up getting another defender in Tori Hansen and a forward in Messiah Bright. I think Messiah Bright was very high on both of our draft prospect lists as someone that could go into a team. And um, she's strong. She's physical. She has a nose for goal and can score in a variety of ways. And really, that's what Orlando needs at this point, because the way that their roster is kind of built up and, and we're going to get into it, uh, they needed to bulk up on both ends of the pitch defensively and in the attacking end. Um, and I think with Marta Adriana, that that'll definitely help them on the offensive side of things. And then you add in a Messiah bright and then across the back line, Emily Madrill is one that I expect to slot right in at the start of the season. No, I'm with you. I think, I think watching this team uh, make the selections that they made in the draft sort of, pivoted our, our off season grade because we weren't too sure um, where we were going to maybe rank them uh, after coming out of that free agency uh, period. But I liked the pieces that they uh, rolled with coming out of the draft. That was when they targeted one of the positions that, that we said that they needed to specifically target, which was they needed some extra help uh, and depth on that back line. And not only did they go out and get probably the highest uh, rated defender in Madrill out of this draft, but Tori Hinson ended up slipping a little bit into, I believe, the second round. They uh, were able to draft uh, her as well. So I think knowing now, uh, as we're doing this preview ahead of the regular season, if we're looking at and comparing some of the additions that they made 
for their roster and comparing that to some of the losses, uh, the players that are no longer going to be part of this team. We're talking about retirements, essentially players who have departed the club, whether it was Darian Jenkins announcing her retirement, uh, Agani Yon's daughter, uh, Aaron McLeod, uh, uh, Tony Presley announced uh, her retirement uh, as well. So there's a couple defensive uh, pieces there. Um, along with trading someone like a Courtney Peterson to Houston and no longer having uh Carrie Lawrence as an option mm -hmm. uh, on the back line, who's out with an uh, indefinitely with a knee injury. So I think sort of looking and comparing the fact that you're going to have a couple defensive pieces that you lost uh, in this off season and sort of taking a look at the draft and the players in front of them that maybe just maybe these are some players who are going to get some extended time with Orlando this season, but they're not the only ones. We still have to break down the roster by position. Take a look at some other players who are part are going to be part of this regular season for Orlando pride. I know uh, we're going to break that down after a, a quick break. March Madness is almost here. Who's in? Who's out? The answers are revealed on the March Madness Selection Show, March 12th on CBS. All right, let's chat a little bit about uh, Orlando Pride's preseason roster by position. We're always excited to take a look at some of the names in preseason because there's always so many names uh, to go through and take a look at. Uh, we saw four goalkeepers listed for this team, Kaylee Collins, McKinley Crone, Anna Morehouse, and Carly Nelson. Um, still trying to iron things out there in terms of who they're going to roll with uh, going uh, in, in net with, uh, with 2023 starting right around the corner. Nine defenders, uh, Carrie Bello, Kaylin Cosme, Tori Hansen, Cecilia. Uh, Carrie Lawrence was listed, uh, Emily Madrill, uh, Haley McCutcherson, Megan Montefusco, and Kylie Strom. Uh, midfielders, maybe a little a bit of an area that we need to pay attention to because for preseason, they listed a whopping five <laughs> midfielders. Uh, Nicole Baskster was uh, brought in as a non-roster invitee. Uh, Michaela Clough, Jordan Lishro, uh, Thais Urheis, and Viviana Villacorta are also included amongst the five midfielders. And ten forwards. So maybe we're going to see some things shift around here for Orlando because that's a double-digit forwards. That's a that's a lot to, to have competing for a place in the top line. Messiah Bright, uh, someone who they selected out of the draft. Uh, Haley Bujeya, and then they've got Julie Doyle, Adriana uh, Leal da Silva, Leah Pruitt, Kristen Scott, Erica Timrick, we've got Marta, and we've got Ellie Watt and Summer Yates, another one of those draft picks for Orlando Pride. When we're sort of taking a look at everything in front of us here, you know, players that stand out as maybe, you know, ones that we'll see in, in an ideal starting 11 for the Pride this season. Yeah, I think one of the biggest question marks comes at, in the goalkeeper position for this team, losing someone like an Aaron McLeod, who was a namestay. Um, Anna Morehouse got time last year um, with this this Orlando team, so that could be somewhere where you slot in. But I think you have to look at the forwards because 10 forwards listed on this roster, where are they going to slot in? How is that going to work out? I think someone I'm circling – in this roster list is a player like Ali Watt. This is a forward that came to Orlando last year from OL Reign and her first game, she ends up scoring a goal. So it was like, great. We're on to, we're off on the right foot. We're on to a great start with Ali Watt. And then as the season goes on, it was almost like she got sucked into the Orlando vortex of struggle bus in, in terms of just not being able to be consistent enough. And, and that's something that Orlando really struggled with last year. I mean, they had a lot of changes, a, a lot of uh, mishaps in the front office that causes them to lose not only their head coach but an assistant coach as well um, having a lot of players be unhappy on the pitch and that doesn't translate well and we saw that a lot last year and then you get a new interim coach coming in at the end of things not necessarily shaking things up completely but also trying to change things you can get back on the winning ways and and back to do the correct things at the end of the year to play spoiler if you're not going to push 
for the playoffs because you're not going to make it. Um, but I think defensively there, there has to be a little bit of question marks coming in with this team because of the injuries and, and the trades that happened and who they lost, right? It, you lose someone like a Courtney Peterson gets traded to Houston, Tony Presley retires, and now Kerry Lawrence is out. Those are three players that saw consistent time yeah. last year. And now that you've lost your goalkeeper as well, your starting goalkeeper from last year, how do you, uh, establish some consistency and and leadership across that back line who's stepping up and who's going to take that role and, and really grab it by the scruff and say this is my team this is my defensive organization and structure I I don't know if an Emily Madrill can do that but I think that she's going to be a really important part of this back line moving forward I think those are probably some of the biggest questions that I have about this roster what are we going to see in goal um, and then who can play and contribute up top. And I'm looking at someone like an Allie Watt in that front line. I think when we're looking at the roster in front of us, I think one of the things that Orlando has going for them as a franchise is, you know, this is, this is a club that has, it's felt like they've, they've been in a rebuild year for the last five years. Um, yeah. And I think when you are a player competing in that kind of environment, I think there's a real opportunity to say, actually, I can come in here fight for a starting spot and never give it back. Yep. You know, so I, I'm looking at, at, at players, young players specifically, you know, to try to get in there and sort of have that attitude and sort of, you know, make things interesting in, in trainings. Um, so it's no surprise that we're going to go with, with somebody like Emily Madrill as our young prospect for Orlando Pride to kind of, you know, go into preseason, come out of preseason, head into regular season with Orlando and, get ready to make an impact. I think that's one of the other things when we're talking about um, the off seasons and how teams targeted their draft selections. Um, yes, you have a lot of players that can come in with potential high ceilings and considered uh, top rated talent. Right. But very rarely um, do you get a wide number of players who are considered um, NWSL ready kind of mm -hmm. talent. And I think that number narrows even more when you're um, talking to different clubs and their staffs about navigating the drafts. The idea of, of saying, hey, we want to target some of the top talent in the first round, that window narrows, that pool of player narrows even more when you specify it to who's going to be NWS already. You're talking maybe one to two possibly three players within uh, the draft who are going to come in and be NWSL ready, right? Because we hear so often about how the transition from college to the professional league takes some time and it's, it's difficult for some players to come in and make that immediate impact off, uh, off the, uh, off the roster. So we've seen in the past players like Atirna Davidson, go number one we've seen Sophia Smith right we see what what that means when we're looking at players who are going to come in here and and make the that kind of impact for their teams and Emily Madrill was a lot of the narrative around her coming into and out of the draft was that she was the most NWSL ready defender out of uh, the defenders amongst uh, the draftees. So we're, we're looking for, for Emily Majil to sort of go in there, make an impact. It was great to chat with her on attacking third about some of her goals and how she wants to navigate uh, her, her professional career moving forward. And, you know, I won't, I won't be surprised if, if there's a, a, a starting 11 that, that features yeah. in Emily Madrill. um, you know, in that starting back line, which is what you, what you want. I mean, we've seen Megan Montefusco kind of hold things down in one of those center back positions and other rotations around her. So it would be really great for this team to kind of solidify a center back duo. And maybe this could be the start for them. I think that's a great point. Megan Montefusco with an Emily Madrill in the center back. Like that sounds great to me. I want to see it. I want to see how that works out, but you're exactly right. There has been, it's a revolving door of that center back position um, next to Montefusco and, and kind of who can step in there and 
and be that player. I'm excited to watch Emily Madrill this year uh, go off and, and be our young prospect. But on this roster, although there are a lot of younger names, maybe some newer names coming in, this is another rebuild year for an Orlando Pride team that has been on this rebuild, as you, as you mentioned, for five years, four years. They're trying to kind of gain traction with that. And I think one thing that this Orlando Pride team can do to gain that traction in their rebuild and, and continue to get better is lean on their veterans. And one of their veterans that re-signed this year early in December with a two-year contract under Seb Hines um, with Orlando is a player like Erica Timrak. Um, this is a, a forward that that definitely plays in the midfield for Orlando and she can solidify a lot of things. She's a veteran in the league. She's been playing in, in this league since 2013. So she knows what is expected of her, what is expected of the league, what is expected of the team. And she's been with Orlando since 2021 after she Utah Royals uh, was no longer a team. This is a player in Tim Rack that, I'm hoping can lead the way for this Orlando pride team. I think if we see her in the midfield alongside someone like uh, Viviana via Corta, that's coming back from injury that she suffered late in last year. That's a duo that I am. I'm really excited to see throw in a Michaela Clough in there, Jordan Listro that we saw last year. Erica Timrak is the player that can be the most consistent on this roster that can really tie together everything that was started at the end of 2022 under Seb Hines and take those steps and be that building player that continues to go with this team and make them one of the best. But she's got to put it all on her back, a player like Tim Rack. I'm with you 100%. I think when we're looking at this roster, it would have been easy to take a look at someone like Martha and say, this is the player that this team, especially younger players are going to draw off of and sort of feed off of their energy and look to as an example for someone who has been around as long as Martha has. But I'm, I'm absolutely with you. And I love that we narrowed it down to someone like an Erica Timrak, uh, because like you said, you, you, Talked a little bit about her career already. She's someone who has played in this league since 2013. But the fact that this player came out of retirement, essentially, to make a return to play in the NWSL, I think also speaks uh, a lot to, to who Tim Rack is uh, as a, not just a person, but as, as a, as a player. So to kind of go from, a former Kansas City franchise that went through some some troubled times despite winning multiple championships, ended up folding, going to Utah Royals and tried to build something with the franchise out there. That team also going through a transition and ended up, you know, coming out of, of, of that was, was Kansas City current. And she retired in, in the beginning of, of 2020, you know, at that point have already made like over a hundred appearances uh, in NWSL. So her, her making the return to NWSL, I thought was, was very unique and very special um, because the pride essentially acquired her rights as part of, of a bigger trade. So you're wondering like, what, what is, what is that going to mean? Um, you know, what are the conversations like, with a player to convince them, right. To come out of retirement and come back and, and play for a franchise that we've been talking about that has sort of hit this reset button time and time again. Right. So I think that this is, um, this is a player that we're going to see this team rely upon a lot. I think they've done it. I think they've done that already a little bit. I mean, Timrick is a player who has put in shifts for this team in the midfield when, people were looking at Orlando and saying, where is your midfield? Yeah. Where is Eric Timrak, <laughs> right? So uh, I'm, I'm curious to, to see, um, you know, the type of responsibility that Seb Hines is going to task her with moving forward. Um, I'm also curious to see if this is a player that they're going to look to and, and hand off the captain's armband to, I mean, who, who's going to be the captain, right? Moving yeah. forward for this Orlando pride team after we saw that armband kind of get passed around between, you know, I think it was John's daughter and I think it was uh, McLeod as well. I think we've seen Martha yeah. wear it at times, but you know, you want to have that go to someone who's going to be consistent and be part of those starting. 11s a week in a week out someone that uh, players can look to um you know as the pointer and the yeller and the director of things so we're looking at tim rack uh, as sort of someone who's going to fulfill that role for this team moving forward and you know what 
because it's a World Cup year, I think it makes sense that we go with someone like Timur because somebody right. like Marta is probably going to be gone with Brazil for the upcoming World Cup. But it's not just Marta. They could also lose somebody like Adriana. We just saw this player alongside Marta in She Believes Cup as well. If player, if uh, fans out there aren't too familiar with their play, you can go back and maybe take a look at some of those three uh, She Believes Cup matches. Um, but a couple players here that they're going to be missing in light of a World Cup. Um, all the more reason, I think, that we take a look at Tim Rack and say, hey, they might rely on this player. So to wrap things up here, let's maybe take a look at uh, a couple things. We want to ask the biggest burning question for Orlando Pride, and we want to make a projected finish prediction. But when it comes to the biggest burning question for Orlando Pride, we went back and forth a little bit on this. Yeah, this was a hard one. Yeah, we, we do the content planning for these episodes, right? And we have these conversations and we're just like, geez, like what, what is it going to be for Orlando this year? Because you take a look at what they went through in, in 2022, ending out their season in 10th place. You take in, into consideration the offseason that they had. And some of this, though, when we were contemplating this, is repetitious. It just sort of feels like Orlando has set themselves up for that rebuild year repeatedly for like almost we said five years jokingly it's like maybe, groundhog day it's like groundhog day so let's say maybe somewhere between like four to three years maybe not five years like you know they, <laughs> they did make the playoffs. we're exaggerating we were exaggerating oh, yeah, a little bit. we like to have fun here we like to have fun so they made the playoffs under Sermani in, in yeah. 2017 yeah. right they eventually introduced Mark Skinner they also did not have you know uh, they also had consecutive bottom table, uh, second half of the table type of finishes. Then you have Mark Skinner depart back to England, coaching in WSL now. What, what's going to happen for this team moving forward? And within these windows of time, there are like these brief stretches of success for the Pride. We saw under Skinner, they went on like a seven game undefeated to yeah. start their regular season. And then obviously his departure came and then they just sort of ended up, they just sort of fizzled out down the stretch. And then yeah, that was 2021. Yeah. yeah. And then it's like, Oh yeah, we're going to have, we're going to enter our, our, our actual rebuilding era once more. It's not going to be with Skinner. It's going to be with Amanda Cromwell. And then that all happened. You can go back and check the episodes when we talked all yeah. about it, look it up on a there. So then it's that, fired halfway through the season, halfway through the season. And you've got, you've got Seb Hines now. So there's a lot of context here when, when, that we have in front of us when we're talking about biggest burning question. So we want to know from Orlando Pride, will this season actually be the first block in an official rebuild for this franchise? It has to be that question because they've been looking up the mountain at a rebuild for years. Can they start to build? Can they start to take those steps? And I think – what we highlighted earlier in this conversation with our young prospect and defender Emily Madrill out of FSU and the veteran uh, forward midfielder Erica Timrak, it starts with those pieces. Um, can they be the ones to to put down this first foundation layer with what Seb Hines is giving them as a team and as a roster, as a club, and start that rebuild. It has they, This team has to put on their horse blinders. They have to block out the noise, block out anything we say here on this show, block out what the haters say, block out what their fans say to some extent, put their head down and work this year and, and make sure that they are starting something new with this new generation and this new wave of Orlando Pride that they have with them. I think, I mean, we talked about it at the top of this conversation about Orlando Pride. They, they've also got Haley Carter in their front office. This is a player or a former player that is now into the administrative role in the NWSL. And I think that's also going to kind of turn the tide a little bit for this team and help them put down that first block for this official rebuild. And it does, it starts at both ends, right? Whether you're a, a draftee coming in to make a name like you're like Emily Madrill, or you're the general manager of a team in Haley Carter. And I think that the entire club is getting on the same page about what they want to be as a club, as a team and what they want to do this year, put their horse blinders on and, and it starts day one, March 25th. Can this be the start of a new leaf for Orlando pride? 
we love to have jokes. You know, we love to have fun here on A3. So maybe we transition this to the projected finish because we sort of feel like we're presenting that biggest question and we're bringing the hype and we're bringing the energy and we want to buy into yeah. this. As I the, do. I do want to buy, into, buy it. into the rebuild. A3 wants to buy into the rebuild, which is which breaks my heart that we have to talk about this projected finish because we still have Orlando Pride finishing within either the final bottom three or final three uh, of the 2023 season. Um, that's not to say that there's still not going to be things to buy into in terms of a rebuild for this team. I think we've talked a lot about uh, individual pieces mm -hmm. and things to get excited about. And I think even within a rebuild year, even within a potential bottom half, possibly bottom table, like last of the table kind of finish. There are things to highlight and get excited about. I'm excited to see Seb Hines get a full season in front of him. Totally. This totally. team, especially after chatting with him and talking about the biggest thing that he wanted out of 2022 was more time with that roster, that they wanted to target players and re-sign them from that 2022 roster and make sure that they were back in 2023 to work with them. So there are things I think to get excited about. They're going to see the return of Marta and extended minutes. They're going to see the return of Viviana Villacorta. This is one of those draft pieces that they selected to try to build a young core in this team. And they should still be excited about this player. And, and she was on such a high before she got that injury. She was yep. getting so many consistent minutes. She yep. was a crucial, crucial part of this Orlando midfield. And, oh, God, heartbreaking. I remember that yeah. game where she went down with that ankle injury and <laughs> she just looked – devastated on the sidelines oh god I, that was so sad to see so that's a player i agree i'm i want to get back on this roster yeah. imagine via corta in the midfield with a marta yeah. like yes orlando has all the pieces they've got to put it together but i just yeah. i agree i don't know i think that this could still be a bottom table team but that doesn't mean they haven't taken their first step in the rebuild it doesn't mean that they didn't put down the foundation about what this team and this club could be in the next several years if they finish at the bottom of the table still. We're going to get to see sophomore seasons for Michaela Clough. Uh, and we're also going to not only for Seb Hines to get a full season, but we're going to get to see hopefully a full season of Ellie Watt with this team. Yes. So let's let's see. Let's present the question of whether or not there's a lot to be excited and hopeful about with this team. We're going to keep it. We're going to present that question. We're going to make sure and see and ask of Orlando if this is going to be the season where we see this first official block in a rebuild and try to compare that with how they finish in the in the regular season. Stay tuned. We'll have to see. We want to see Orlando Pride finally take that, that first step officially. Uh, but that's going to be a wrap for the Pride uh, on this one, at, on Attacking Third. Thank you all so much for joining along and listening to our previews. Make sure you download, follow, and listen to us any where you get your podcasts you can watch us too so please subscribe to us on youtube so that you get alerts whenever we do go live at youtube.com slash attacking third we'll be back with more team by team previews for the 2023 season it kicks off on march 25th on paramount plus for sandra Herrera and lisa roman this was attacking third